Hi everyone and welcome to my channel History Calling. Today we're heading back to the year 1809 to take a look at the disappearance of British diplomat Benjamin Bathurst in the German town of Pearlberg. Was it an accident, foil play, or perhaps something supernatural? Stay tuned to hear the details of one of the most infamous missing persons cases of all time. Benjamin was born in London on the 14th of May 1784, the son of Henry Bathurst, later Bishop of Norwich, who was also a distant cousin of the third Earl Bathurst. After attending Oxford University, Benjamin married Philadelphia Cole, better known as Philida, in May 1805, and by 1809 the couple had two daughters. There is a photograph of a portrait supposedly of Benjamin floating around the internet, however I've chosen not to include it here as I've been unable to find the source of the image and so I can't be sure that it actually is him or indeed what copyright status the photograph has. What we do have, however, are several descriptions of Benjamin from those who knew him. Based on these, we know that he was around six feet tall, slim, with fair or perhaps light brown hair, large bluish grey eyes, a high forehead, a straight Grecian nose, to use his sister's phrase, good teeth, and at the time of his disappearance, a moustache. So now that we know where he came from and what he looked like, let's examine how this young Englishman ended up in a small, unheard of town in faraway Germany. His journey begins in 1804, when, through the influence of Earl Bathurst, because shameless nepotism was encouraged back then, Benjamin enters the diplomatic service, working first in Vienna, then Stockholm the following year. He's back in England in 1808, however, and reportedly in poor health, which he attributes to, quote, long illness and various disappointments, presumably an indication that he doesn't feel his career is progressing as well as it should. He sufficiently recovered the following year, however, to take up an appointment as a British Foreign Office agent to Austria. At this point, Austria is seeking support from Britain against this man, Napoleon Bonaparte, and Bathurst's instructions are to inform the Austrian government that, if the Emperor, meaning Francis II, is disposed to renew his former relations of amity with His Majesty, meaning George III of the United Kingdom, then the King would send a minister to Vienna to make such an agreement. Benjamin sets off from Portsmouth at the beginning of March, accompanied by a messenger named Joseph Kreuss and a Swiss servant named Nicolas Hilbert, who speaks French and German. His instructions as to where to go depend on the course of international events, and so the group travel first to Malta, then Trieste, where they arrive on the 19th of April, before proceeding north to Vienna a week later. They remain there well into May, but leave the city to join the Austrian government in Buda on the 12th of May, after they flee from the advancing Napoleon. In late June, Benjamin finds himself in trouble with the British Foreign Secretary, George Canning. Canning criticises him for overstepping the mark in his communications with and criticism of the Austrian government regarding their handling of the Napoleonic threat, and Benjamin is stung by this reprimand. Having received Canning's letter towards the end of July, he writes to beg forgiveness in August. He'll continue to worry about this incident for the rest of his short life, especially as he doesn't receive any further communications from Canning before his death. The autumn of 1809 sees another shift in continental affairs. After a disastrous attack by the British on the Scheldt estuary, which ends with their troops having to evacuate, the Austrians can no longer rely on their support and instead have to submit to Napoleon. The Treaty of Schönbrunn is signed on the 14th of October, by which Austria is required to end its official relationship with Britain. When Benjamin is informed of this ten days later, he writes to the British Foreign Office that he'll return to England as soon as possible. Now, by his own admission, Benjamin dislikes travelling by sea, and he tells his wife that he'll go first to the Prussian port of Kohlberg, then travel from there through Sweden, which is neutral in the continental conflict. He's refused a passport to go through French-controlled Prussia, however, and instead he, Hilbert and Kreuss decide to travel via Hamburg. False passports are obtained for Benjamin, who becomes a German merchant named Koch, K-O-C-H, and for Kreuss, who becomes Herr Fischer, and the party leave Buda at 5am on the 10th of November, taking 10 days to reach Berlin. It's worth noting that during this time, Benjamin is apparently in good spirits, despite his concerns over Canning's rebuke and worries about the fact that he hasn't heard from his wife since late June. In Berlin, however, things rapidly deteriorate. 
Already tired from the journey, Bathurst's lack of German makes him nervous of the guards who question them at the city's gates, and he's distressed that the Austrian ambassador, Baron Wessenberg, a man who Benjamin knows, is absent. He begins to talk of plots against him, which will lead to him being seized by the French, and at dinner with the local dignitary, Count Bombel, he complains that his nerves are shattered and that he's unwell. Bombel, for his part, agrees, thinking that Bathurst looks physically weak and is having trouble walking. It's during this brief stay in Berlin that Bathurst may also have met with members of a secret Prussian society known as the Tugendbund, meaning the League of Virtue, of whom we'll hear more later. On the 23rd of November, Bathurst and his group leave Berlin and continue towards Hamburg, having obtained fresh passports from the Prussian government. It's now just two days until his disappearance, and his mental and physical health continue to cause concern. On the night of the 24th of November, while staying at Kletz, he screams in the middle of the night that he's been poisoned, and the maid who attends him during his brief stay there will later recall him complaining of bowel pains. The following morning, the day of his disappearance, he rises late, writes a letter to his wife, and the group set off again at around 9am. We now come to the pivotal, final few hours of Benjamin's known life. Inside the carriage, he appears paranoid and petrified for his safety, worrying that he's being followed and having a physical altercation with Kraus, who he raves is one of those bent on destroying him. Yet he then calms down again and asks Kraus to deliver farewell messages to his wife should anything happen to him. In the early afternoon, the group reach Pearlberg, a place later described as almost a frontier town, overrun with all sorts of rabble, and even dispersed and dismissed officers from their armies and the neighbouring countries seem to have chosen that place for their abode, without having been able to justify themselves before the magistrates as to their object in doing so. It's here that the group decide to rest for a few hours, though their plans are ever-changing and more than once they order the horses, only to countermand them soon after. A ball is being given for the local nobility in a hotel in the town, making rooms hard to come by, and Benjamin and his companions are instead allowed the use of a room in the local post house. They eat at the nearby Swan Inn, and afterwards, near 5pm, Benjamin leaves his travelling companions and walks through the town to the residence of Captain von Klitzing, the governor of Pearlberg. He introduces himself to Klitzing, though it's unknown if he confides to him his real identity. His poor disguise as a German merchant must be easy to see through, however, for remember, he barely speaks the language. He tells the captain that he is in fear for his safety and requests an armed guard to return him to Berlin. Klitzing refuses this, but does allow him two guards to protect him during his time in Pearlberg. While with Klitzing, Benjamin is served tea by the young housekeeper, later called Mrs. Kestern, who notes that he is shaking so hard he can barely hold the cup and appears, quote, in a most lamentable state. She sees that he is well dressed, however, with a diamond brooch, light trousers, and a magnificent fur cloak. Together they converse a little in his broken German and her broken French, and he tells her that he is much cast down and that he must be quickly off. By around 6pm, he's ready to leave. He gives the maid a gift of money, which she initially tells people she refused to take, only to admit decades later that she did in fact accept it. Then looking out the window as Bathurst walks away, she notes that instead of crossing the market square to go back to the post house, he turns down a street which leads in the direction of the shoe market and the German coffee house where the ball is taking place. Minutes later, a local ne'er-do-well, August Schmidt, the son of the postmaster, and a person who we'll hear more of later, arrives and asks for the foreigner. The maid tells him the direction Bathurst took. Back at the post house, Bathurst continues to act in a highly overwrought state. He keeps his two pistols with him at all times, which he has had August Schmidt's mother purchase shot for. He fires them out of the post house window and seems more distrustful than ever of Christ. He writes a number of letters and is only calmed when Christ suggests they burn the diplomatic dispatches they are carrying, as these would lead to serious trouble for Benjamin if they were discovered on him by the French. They do so, also destroying Benjamin's freshly written letters, then eat dinner and drink heavily. At about 7pm, Bathurst dismisses the two guards Klitzing had sent to protect him. According to Kreuss, and bear in mind we have only his word for it, Bathurst apologises for ever suspecting him of wishing him harm, and sleeps at the table for a couple of hours, holding Kreuss's hand. It's now 9pm, and disaster is imminent. 
Benjamin awakes and asks Kraus to order the horses for the next stage of their journey, and Ilbert to help finish with the packing. The account given by Kraus, and which is repeated in the memoirs of Benjamin's father, describe him standing in the kitchen or some of the offices in the midst of the postillions, ostlers, etc., and pulling out his watch and a purse containing a considerable sum of money before those people. In any event, he then goes for a walk while his orders are being carried out. He is seen in the yard by a number of people and is described as wearing dark grey trousers, a grey coat edged with lace and a fur cap. There is no mention of his cloak. These witnesses see him turn down a side street and after that, nothing. Fifteen minutes later, the horses are ready and his companions go looking for him, but Benjamin is nowhere to be found. There is no immediate panic when Bathurst can't be located. Only after an hour has elapsed with no word from him does Christ become uneasy. He goes to Captain von Klitzing, who is now at the ball, and search efforts are initiated. Over the next ten days, locals look high and low for the missing merchant Koch, still unaware of his real identity. The local countryside is combed, a number of houses and other buildings are searched, bloodhounds are used, and the river Stepnitz is even drained by a local fisherman named Grove in case his body should be found there. But it's all in vain. Not a trace of the lost diplomat is found. Kraus and Ilbert, for their parts, are taken into custody by Klitzing and are placed in a local hotel, the Golden Crown. Whether for their own protection or because he suspects them of foul play is unclear, though they are permitted to communicate with each other and are not allowed to be interrogated by the local magistrates. They are eventually released on the 10th of December and return to Berlin, then Vienna. An early line of inquiry focuses on Bathurst's sable cloak lined with violet-coloured velvet, which Klitzing's maid had observed him wearing at around 6pm. When his possessions are recovered from the post house, it is discovered that this cloak is missing, as is Krauss's. After much searching, they are discovered in the possession of the Schmidt family, and August Schmidt and his mother, who we met earlier, are sentenced to eight weeks imprisonment for theft, having unsuccessfully claimed that they thought the cloaks had been left by two Jewish merchants who had been in the post house earlier in the day and to whom they intended to return the cloaks too. On the 16th of December, the only definitive trace of Bathurst ever found surfaces in a forest near Quitzau, roughly three miles away from Pearlberg. This is his pair of pantaloons, discovered turned inside out by two women named Veed and Grundman, who were out collecting wood. In the pocket is the note he had written to his wife on the morning of his disappearance. The pantaloons appear to have been placed in the wood very recently in hopes that they'd be found, for despite heavy rains over the preceding three weeks, the pencil-written letter is still intact and legible. Some accounts will go on to say that the pantaloons had bullet holes through them, but no blood, as if they had been shot through once removed from Benjamin's body. Other sources, including newspaper reports made soon after the event, and an account written by his wife, to whom the trousers and letter were returned, make no mention of this damage. The letter itself is interesting. It contains some ramblings that Bathurst was surrounded by enemies, perhaps meaning Kraus, would be destroyed by the machinations of one Count de Tregu and the Russians, and begs his wife not to marry again if he dies, a request which she honours, incidentally. Frau Vied, who had first found the trousers, also reports that, two or three weeks earlier, she had seen what she thought was a large black dog sitting in roughly the same spot, something which frightened her so much that she ran away. The historian Michael Mason, however, has wondered if this might have been Benjamin's body, covered with a jacket or coat prior to his burial. The news of his disappearance takes time to trickle back to England, but in December Benjamin's father Henry is summoned to the home of Lord Wellesley and informed of the events in Pearlburg. It's reported in the local press the following month, and his real name is reported in the Hamburg Correspondent newspaper on the 3rd of January 1810. By mid-January, his more distant relations have all but given up on him, and Earl Bathurst writes to Benjamin's mother that the accounts leave little to hope. The English government and family each put up a £1,000 reward for information, a truly enormous sum at that time, but nothing more is heard. Dissatisfied with the official investigation, however, his wife and her brother then set out in June 1810 on an extraordinary trip across the continent, obtaining passports along the way from Napoleon, which allow them to travel throughout German Napoleonic territories unhindered in search of Benjamin or any news of him. 
Despite their extensive inquiries in Pearlberg, Berlin, Paris and elsewhere, however, ultimately they find nothing. So what had happened to this young diplomat? Well, a number of theories have been put forward, which I'm going to go through in order from what I consider the least likely to the most. Theory 1. Supernatural Forces <sighs> Okay, let's begin by unpicking this story, as it's something you'll see scattered all over the internet if you look up Benjamin's name. The origins of this theory, and I use that term in the loosest possible way, appear to lie in two places. First is a comment in an article published in a German publication called The New Pit of Hell around 1850, which said that Bathurst's disappearance was so strange it was, quote, similar to magic, just as if the ground had opened itself under his feet and swallowed him up, closing itself upon him without leaving the least trace, end quote. The article as a whole, though, does not suggest paranormal activity at all and simply uses this turn of phrase to emphasise how sudden and inexplicable Benjamin's disappearance was. Second is an article published in the Cornhill magazine in 1887. This said that Benjamin was watching his carriage being readied, then stepped around to the head of the horses and was never seen again. This has then led some to suppose that he must have popped out of existence in an instant into some sort of parallel universe, possibly through a wormhole or a tear in the space-time continuum. The simplest way to deal with this is to talk you through the wider section of text in which this comment appears. The paragraph begins by saying that Benjamin returned to the inn, which should actually say post house, after visiting von Klitzing to write letters and burn papers. So far, so good. It then continues. At seven o'clock, he dismissed the soldiers on guard and ordered the horses to be ready by nine. He stood outside the inn watching his portmanteau, which had been taken within, being replaced on the carriage, stepped around to the head of the horses and was never seen again. As we've seen from the evidence though, this isn't what occurred. The Cornhill magazine has fudged the timeline of events by omitting the two hours between 7 and 9 p.m. and making no mention of Benjamin's ravings within the post house, his dinner, apology to Kraus or his nap. It also goes on in the next paragraph to give a clearer account of his final known seconds, which counteracts this supernaturally tinged interpretation of events. It points out how dark it was at that time of year, that there were few artificial lights available, and says that of the people standing around the yard, quote, no one particularly observed the movements of Mr. Bathurst at that moment. He had gone to the horse's heads where the ostler's lantern had fallen on him, end quote. Then when everything was ready, those in the yard waited. They sent up to the room which Mr. Bathurst had engaged. They called, all in vain. Suddenly, inexplicably, without a word, a cry, an alarm of any sort, he was gone, spirited away, and what really became of him will never be known with certainty. So there you go. Even the Cornhill magazine admits that Benjamin was spirited away, by humans that is, and that nothing untoward was seen by the people in the yard. In fact, as we've seen, some witnesses claimed to have seen him walking down a side street, and it was only when he failed to return after an hour that his fellow travellers became alarmed. He did not pop out of existence in front of witnesses, only for his trousers to reappear in a forest three miles away several weeks later. So I hope we can put that idea to rest. Theory 2. The Runaway this idea is based on a report from a man by the name of Louis Drusina, a British secret agent living in the town of Konigsberg in 1809. Drusina told Philida Bathurst and her brother George Call during their inquiries after Benjamin that an English traveller, supposedly a courier, presented himself at Drusina's house one evening in December 1809 while Drusina was out, and upon learning from the maid that her master was not at home, refused to leave his name or a message, but told her that he would either meet her master in the post house the next day, or possibly call again the following morning. Sources differ on this particular point. He never reappeared, however, nor was there any trace of him at the Konigsberg post house. The theory is that this might have been Benjamin, and that having walked out of Pearlberg of his own accord, perhaps because of his misgivings about his travelling companions, he made it to the coast alone and called at the home of Drusina. He then boarded a ship from Sweden to England, which ultimately sank, taking the unfortunate Mr. Bathurst to a watery grave. Again, however, this theory is riddled with holes. 
Though the maid said the strange Englishman matched Benjamin's description, in fact she caught only a glimpse of him in the doorway before her candle was blown out by the breeze, and we should ask ourselves just how likely is it that Benjamin, in a delicate state of mind, walked 400 miles, just days after Count Bombell had noted him walking with difficulty, entirely alone and undetected, through bandit-infested countryside, in a strange land speaking virtually no German and with little money or even his travelling cloak with him. It also doesn't account for the discovery of his pantaloons three weeks after his disappearance. A variation of the runaway theory is that in his desperation to get away from Kraus, who he evidently mistrusted, Bathurst arranged with some unknown person or persons in Pearlberg to help him get out of the town and was subsequently killed by them or died of other causes during his journey. The pantaloons could later have been placed out in the open to try to deflect attention away from his real route out of town. The need to make arrangements for this attempted escape might explain why he didn't immediately return to the post house after leaving von Klitzing's at 6pm on the evening of his disappearance, why August Schmidt, who spoke multiple languages and could have acted as an interpreter, was looking for him as soon as he left von Klitzing's, and why Benjamin dismissed his armed guard despite his concerns for his safety. Kraus himself wondered to fill at a Bathurst if Benjamin had feigned a state of calm after his final outburst in the post house in order to get away from him without raising suspicion. Von Klitzing's behaviour also raised questions. He left Pearlberg at noon on the 26th of November for a day, apparently to get orders from Berlin as to what to do, but perhaps, if we go with the runaway theory, to help ensure that Bathurst had left safely. There is another piece of evidence which might support this idea, for Sir John Hall, writing in 1922, cites two witness statements given by a Dr. Benf and a Mr. Frank on the 18th of December, which said that von Klitzing and a nervous-looking Bathurst were seen talking in the street near the post house and even in the post house itself about two hours after Bathurst's arrival in the town, and therefore before Benjamin had been to von Klitzing's home and taken tea from his housekeeper. If they did speak in much more detail than has otherwise been assumed, then perhaps they were concocting a getaway plan for Bathurst, with Klitzing showing him where to go in the evening to meet one of his men. There are problems with these statements, however, for Frank also placed Bathurst in the post house between 5 and 6 p.m. at exactly the time he was supposedly at von Klitzing's home. The length of time which had passed also creates the possibility that both Benf and Frank were mistaken or had been prepped beforehand by von Klitzing as to what to say, for he was the one who had them examined and who witnessed their statements. As with so much of the story, there is in the end no definitive evidence to support this theory. Benjamin would still not have had much money on him and no cloak, and von Klitzing soon had half the town engaged in a huge, time-consuming and one can only assume expensive search effort, something of an overkill, no pun intended, if he knew Bathurst was safe and well. We might also wonder why he didn't at any time admit to having helped Bathurst escape, or why he would have helped a clearly unstable foreigner travelling under a false name with such a rash plan. Theory 3 Benjamin brought about his own demise. This idea, at first glance at least, does have some merit. Multiple sources confirm that Benjamin was most definitely in a disturbed state of mind at the time of his disappearance, with concerns centering around his future job prospects in particular. In a letter to his wife dated the 14th of October, he told her that, quote, I have now nothing but Parliament to look to. I must succeed in placing myself there, somehow or other. My distress is very great owing to having no intelligence from England." End quote. He also had two pistols in his possession which he had purchased shot for on the day he disappeared. Dying by his own hand was certainly a popular theory amongst the British and French governments. In the newspaper Le Moniteur, a mouthpiece for Napoleon, an article appeared on the 29th of January which declared that, From information we have received from Berlin, we believe Mr Bathurst had gone off his head. It is the manner of the British Cabinet to commit diplomatic commissioners to persons whom the whole nation knows are half fools. It is only the English diplomatic service which contains crazy people. Even Earl Bathurst considered this a possibility, telling Benjamin's wife that Benjamin must have brought about his own end or perhaps fallen victim to common robbers. In another letter, though clearly designed to comfort Benjamin's mother in mid-January, he told her that, quote, if he has fallen, there is much more reason to imagine that it is by the hand of others than that it was by his own hand. He has lost no money at play, nor has he in any way misconducted himself. 
Yet Benjamin was clearly in fear of his life being taken by others. He showed no inclination to end it himself and was in fact desperate to return home safely to England and his family. In the same letter written in October, in which he expressed concerns about his job prospects, he also told his wife that, quote, I shall rejoice to return once more to you, end quote. He'd asked for a guard during his time in Pearlburg, and there's no evidence that he killed himself there. No gunshot was heard, and had he committed the deed either by that method or by any other, his body would surely have been found quickly and nearby, especially given the use of bloodhounds. His wife rapidly came to the same conclusion writing that had he died in this manner, quote, his remains must have been found, for no man swimming as he did and with pistols in his pocket would have attempted to drown himself, end quote. Ending his own life also fails to account for the discovery of his pantaloons three weeks later, with a pencil-written note still easily read. These had clearly been placed in the woods by an unknown party not long before they were discovered. Theory 4. The Prisoner this theory stems from a report made to Phyllida Bathurst during her searches for her husband that he had been kidnapped by Napoleonic forces and imprisoned in the fortress in the nearby town of Magdeburg. Phyllida was told that the governor of the fortress had confided to a lady at a ball that he had the English diplomat in his possession. Yet when she followed up with him, the governor admitted to having made the remark but denied it related to Benjamin, saying he had instead been referring to a Louis Fritz who had since left the area. His story was later disproven, however, and Louis Fritz appears to have been a complete fabrication. Despite the offer of being allowed to examine all the prisoners, though, Phyllida Bathurst elected not to do so, feeling that if her husband had been taken there or to France, she would never be allowed to discover him. That wasn't the end of the matter, though. When Phyllida and her brother returned to England, she was visited by the same Count d'Antragu whom Benjamin had raved about in the letter to her found in his abandoned pantaloons. The Count, a Frenchman then living in London, who had switched sides several times during recent history, sometimes working for the French, sometimes for the Russians or the British, told her that Benjamin was dead, having indeed been killed by the French in Magdeburg Fortress, and that the Governor had lied to her when she met him. Before the Count could receive proof from France to support his claims, though, he and his wife were murdered by one of their servants, an Italian who either killed himself directly afterwards or died in a scuffle with the Count. Phyllida Bathurst wondered if the French had had the Count killed for talking to her about her husband's fate, but with Dantragu dead, so too was the Magdeburg line of inquiry. Theory 5. Murder. This is, to my mind, by far the most likely scenario, but it's complicated by the sheer number of suspects. Let's take them one by one. Theory 5.1. Killed by the Tugendbund. This theory was proposed in 1922 by Sir John Hall. He posited that Benjamin had indeed been in contact with his secret group whilst in Berlin and that his deteriorating mental health had alarmed them to such a degree that they had had him killed to prevent him spilling their secrets. There is no evidence Bathurst even met with members of this organisation, however, much less that they had him killed and grabbing him outside the post house would have been a matter of mere chance. Had he not decided to go for a walk before departing Pearlberg, he would have had to have been attacked on the road with Kreuz, Ilbert and at least one carriage driver to assist him, and that could have been done a day or two earlier whilst he was travelling to Pearlberg. For my part, I don't find this theory very convincing. Theory 5.2 Killed by the French there are various pieces of evidence which would support the idea that Benjamin was the victim of the French, and alongside the possibility of him having ended his own life, it was a popular theory amongst the English press and government. For one thing, Bathurst wouldn't have been the first British diplomat seized by continental forces. As recently as 1804, Sir George Rumbold had been arrested by the French in Hamburg and briefly imprisoned before the King of Prussia secured his release. A second man, a British courier by the name of Wagstaff, had then been seized the following year not far from Pearlberg and the dispatches he was carrying taken by the French. In an article in the Times dated the 20th of January 1810, the newspaper played down any suggestion that Bathurst was physically or mentally unwell, reminded its readers of Rumbold and Wagstaff's experiences, and declared that information had been received within these few days which forcibly tends to fix the guilt of Mr B's death or disappearance on the French government. A few months later, the European magazine and London Review wrote that it was more than probable that the French executive, with a view to ascertain by his papers the nature of the relations subsisting between this country and the Austrian government, had added to the catalogue of its crimes by the seizure or probably the murder of this gentleman. 
Benjamin himself was clearly worried about the possibility of the capture as we know from his vocal concerns that he was being followed and would be killed and from his decision just a few hours before his disappearance to burn the dispatches he was charged with bringing back to England. His wife also thought while she was in Paris that the French seemed the likeliest suspects and despite being allowed by Napoleon to search for her husband and to place adverts in the French newspapers including Le Moniteur, she wrote that Napoleon's assistance to her was only to me a proof that he knew it was impossible to discover the truth and thought to lull suspicion by this apparent frankness. Countering this argument though is the fact that neither of the previously seized men had been killed nor did Benjamin have the diplomatic dispatches in his possession, having just burnt them. As the French didn't mind it being known that they occasionally seized British diplomats, there was no reason to kill Bathurst simply to keep him quiet. Nor was there any need to seize him using such covert measures. He could have been publicly arrested. Philida Bathurst may have distrusted Napoleon's offers of help, but the fact remains that the Emperor went to considerable efforts to assist her, though he wasn't obliged to do so, and he could equally have been trying to clear himself and the French of any involvement in a crime they had nothing to do with. Theory 5.3 Killed by Local Criminals This last theory is in many ways the simplest and seems the most likely to me. From his dress and manners, Bathurst was evidently a wealthy foreigner and he'd taken little care to hide the money he was carrying about his person or his expensive diamond pin and pocket watches. He would have made a tempting target for some of the more disreputable people frequenting Pearlburg at the time and could easily have been grabbed as he wandered the side streets in the dark near the post house. One potential suspect for such a crime appears in the form of August Schmidt, the known criminal in Pearlburg who had come into contact with Bathurst at the post house, sought him out a mere three hours before his disappearance and who had stolen Bathurst and Krause's cloaks. Mrs Kestern, that was the maid at von Klitzing's remember, believed that he had had something to do with the matter, as did a Dr Armstrong, an Englishman living in Berlin who had met Benjamin there and travelled to Pearlburg after the latter's disappearance to see if he could uncover any evidence of what had happened. Interestingly though, Philida Bathurst met Schmidt but didn't believe he had had anything to do with her husband's disappearance, despite acknowledging that he was a rogue. Nor did she think local criminals had killed him, reasoning, somewhat dubiously I think, that the high bribes, as she put it, which she offered for information, would have caused a betrayal amongst their ranks. Schmidt was not the only name suggested, however. Bathurst's sister noted that the ostler who had seen Benjamin in the yard moments before his disappearance had absconded a few days later and was never seen again, something she called, quote, the most striking circumstance in any account that has been obtained, end quote. When Phyllida was in Pearlburg in 1810, she was told by a Mrs. Anna Sophia Catherine Hacker, who was a local criminal then in prison in the town, that she knew of a man named Goldberg living in Seaburg, who had recently come into a considerable sum of money, and who had told Hacker that it was hush money given to keep him quiet, quote, when the English man was murdered. Mrs. Hacker later retracted her story, however, and the cobbler whom she directed authorities to was cleared of any wrongdoing. There is some additional tantalising evidence which might suggest that Bathurst never made it out of Pearlburg, however, and that he was the victim of foul play. These are three skeletons discovered in or near the town in the decades after his disappearance. The first was found face down in a moral pit near the town in 1830. No other information is known, however, as for reasons unknown, local authorities denied it could be Bathurst's and the newspapers were forbidden to report on the matter. In April 1852, a second skeleton was discovered under the kitchen floor during the pulling down of a house near Pearlburg and possibly close to the Swan Inn where Bathurst and his companions had dined soon after arriving in the town. More intriguing still, this individual had suffered a hatchet blow to the head and had been found in the former home of a Mr Christian Mertens, who in 1809 had worked as a servant in the Swan. Suspicion fell on the long-dead Mertens for this reason and also for the generous diaries he had been able to give his daughters upon their marriages, which seemed beyond the reach of a mere servant, but there was no conclusive evidence. Completely by chance, Benjamin's sister Trefana arrived in Pearlburg four months later and was shown the skull. She declared it couldn't be her brother based on her recollections of him and a miniature portrait she had brought with her and signed an affidavit to that effect. Whether she was correct will never be known. Trefena hadn't seen her brother for over 43 years and was a child when he disappeared, nor do we know if the portrait she carried was even a particularly accurate likeness of Benjamin. If it was the portrait which can now be found on the internet when his name is searched, it was a profile view only. 
She also complicates the story of Mr. Mertens by saying that the house in which the skeleton was found had actually belonged to a porter who worked at the Golden Crown Hotel, where Krauss and Eilbert were kept after Benjamin's disappearance. Finally, in 1910, a third skeleton was found, buried face down around one and a half metres deep in forest around Roden von Wald near Quitsau. If that place sounds familiar, it's because Quitsau was the same area of woods in which Benjamin's trousers had been found just over a century earlier, and the skeleton was apparently only around 200 yards from that spot. This individual had been bludgeoned to death, but was apparently a large man, unlike the slim Bathurst. Further investigations could not be made, however, because after the remains were discovered, they were left in the open air over a weekend, during which time they were broken up by local children. Because, you know, there was no TV back then, and kids had to make their own fun. In the end, all we can truly ascertain from the discovery of these three skeletons is that Pearlberg and the surrounding area was not a particularly safe place to be. And so we come to the end of the curious tale of Benjamin Bathurst. What do you think happened to him? Was he murdered? Did he do something to himself? Was it a simple accident? If nothing else, I hope I have at least convinced you that it wasn't supernatural. I would love to discuss your thoughts with you in the comments section below, and I look forward to talking to you again in the next video. Till then, keep learning. Oh, 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 oh,